So guys, our last chapter of this course is talking about chapter 16. We're going to look at how we interpret the financial statements. Now, we're going to spend some time looking at various ratios and some aspects that I want you to understand for this chapter. I believe we talked about some ratios in this class, haven't we? Foot ratio? Okay. So a little bit of it is going to be a review. Um, we're going to take some time and um, just understand when we look at a financial statement, what is it we're looking at? What are we trying to derive from this financial statement? So as you see here, we're going to learn about comparisons, how we can take information and compare it between one company and another or one year to the next. And we're going to talk about various types of analysis, horizontal analysis, trend analysis, vertical analysis, and ratio analysis. Um, again, with every chapter, we talk about some of these concepts. Relevance is that the information that you're providing would affect and, and benefit the user of the financial statement. Predictive value is information that will help users for future decisions. And for information to be comparable, the best way that we can understand how numbers work is by taking those numbers and being able to make sense out of them by comparing them to either a previous year or to another company. So we really understand what are these numbers really all about. And the concept of timeliness. If we are looking at information from four years ago, that really isn't going to help us today in making decisions about do we want to invest in a company. We need our information to be timely for it really to be beneficial for us. Receiving information on a timely basis helps influence decisions. So what is financial statement analysis? Basically, financial statement analysis is used to show how items in a company's financial statements relate to the company's financial performance objectives. So what does that mean? A lot of times the company has budgets they need to adhere to or goals for their business. So we're going to look at this information to see did in fact that company meet their goals that they had set forward. And again, we're going to look at the understanding, oh, remind me later. So we're going to, um, does the company meet their goals? And in meeting their goals, this information that we're gathering, it needs to be relevant, which means it helps us make decisions. It needs to be able to help us make decisions based about what we might do in the future, investing, lending them money, not lending them money, running from a company, wanting to work with a particular company. And this information, we need to be able to compare it so it makes sense to us. And ultimately, it needs to be on a timely basis. So when we do this financial statement analysis, various stakeholders in a company want information. They want to see, is a company profitable? Is it making money? Is it, is it really um, satisfying the reason for which this company is in business? And are they using their assets in a, a smart manner compared to other companies? Are they using their assets equally or better? How liquid is a company? Which means, can they pay their bills when the bills are due? Do they have enough money to pay bills as they come due? And then, what kind of financial risk is at stake with this company? Management 
uses debt and stockholder investments effectively without jeopardizing the future of a company. The more difficult it is to predict future profitability and liquidity, the greater the risk of the company. So what they're probably saying here, or what they are saying here is, when you invest in a company, you're not going to want to invest in a company that's going to go into the tubes next year. You want to put your money into a company that you can tell is going to have long-term growth. For sure, it's going to be around in the future, and it's going to be doing well. It's going to be successful. So one element of looking at the, the success of a company is to see how risky they are. Think of it like this. If you are a mortgage lender and you have a client that comes and they want to borrow money from you, a homeowner, and this particular individual has had four jobs in the past year, the, um, the homeowner or wannabe homeowner, um, his cr the credit report is terrible because they don't pay their bills when they're supposed to. They've had bankruptcy in the past. They're going to be a risk for you to lend them money versus another homeowner that comes in. They have a perfect credit score. They've been at the same job for 20 years. They've never had a glitch in any problems. They've always paid their bills on time. That homeowner is going to be pretty sound for you. So you, you can feel fairly safe that if you lend them money, it's going to be okay. The same is true with businesses. You want to be able to invest in businesses that are going to be around. You don't want to lose your money. Yet you want it to be profitable. So financial risk shows, is this company operating on tough times or have they been pretty solid in the past because usually the past will predict the future and then operating asset management the managers use the current assets and current liabilities in a way that supports growing their revenues and minimizes investment so are these managers using their resources in the best way they can or are they letting idle cash just sit? You want them to be utilizing their money as effectively as they're able to. So what are some measures that we're going to look at? When we're looking at these financial statements, decision makers have to look and see whether the relationships they find in the financial statements are positive or could be negative. How are we going to know that? We're going to know it by comparing the numbers to other numbers. Many financial analysts, investors, and lenders apply general standards to measure key financial ratios. So, for example, when we're dealing with a ratio called the current ratio, which basically is measuring current assets divided by current liabilities, the higher the ratio, the more likely the company will be able to meet its liabilities. A ratio of 2 to 1 is higher than desirable. What that means, if a current ratio is 2 to 1, let me just get in an Excel and show you what we're talking about here. If a current ratio is 2 to 1, that means their total current assets are at 200,000 and their total current liabilities are at 100,000. So if we take our 200,000 divided by 100,000, so the current ratio is equal to current assets, current assets divided by current liabilities, okay? If this number is 2, which is what it would be here, 200,000 divided by 100,000 would be 2. That means they have double the current assets that they have to debt, current debt. That's good. Usually companies are definitely over 1, 1.5 or so. But if they start going higher than 2, 
then that, that means they're not really utilizing their assets to the best manner in which they could be. Maybe some of their cash needs to go into investments so they can make better money on, on their, uh, better invet, uh, a better return on their money than just sitting in idle cash not making any money. So if the current ratio is 2, that's pretty sound. If it goes higher than 2, maybe a manager, the management is not using their resources in the best manner that they can. Make sense? If a current ratio is 1, well, that means, think about it, they have 100,000 of current assets to 100,000 of current liabilities. They're just barely getting by. Does that make sense, guys, what I'm telling you there? So, in this respect, if the ratio is 2 to 1, then we're, we're doing pretty good. The current liabilities to net worth ratio Normally, a business starts to have trouble when this relationship exceeds 80%. So we're going to look at these various ratios and, and understand it. So if their current liabilities divided by the net worth is over 80%, then that means they've got a lot of debt, and it's bordering on getting critical. Comparing financial measures or ratios of the same company over time is an improvement over using the rule of thumb measures. Because if you can take a company and compare several years at a time, you can see if things are improving with certain ratios or if they're declining. <coughs> Such a comparison gives the person who's analyzing the information a basis for judging whether the me measure or ratio is getting better or worse, which helps you see trends. Projections must be made with care because trends can reverse over time. Sometimes companies need to change the way they're doing things. Using a company's past performance as a standard of comparison is not helpful in judging its performance relative to that of other companies. It's helping them judge their performance based on previous years, okay? However, when you take companies within the same industry and you look and see how companies compare to other companies in that same industry, which overcomes some of the limitations of comparing companies' measures over time, sometimes you get a better understanding of how is this company faring in the market with its competitors? Industry norms have certain limitations. Comparability, even though companies may be in the same industry, you might not be able to compare them, such as, I flew Spirit Airlines last night. Spirit is a very small company. Can I necessarily compare Spirit Airlines financial statements to that of American, one of the largest companies, or Delta? Maybe in some respect, but really we're dealing with a totally different type of company just because of pure size. Or sometimes if we deal with FedEx versus Delta, even though they're both airlines, one's carrying packages, the other one's carrying people. Does that make sense? So you have to be aware of what you're comparing. Accounting differences. Some companies with similar operations may use different types of accounting procedures, different ways they value things. So you have to be aware of specifics on what kind of depreciation are they using? How are they rating their inventory? So you can really compare apples to apples. And then diversity. Diversified companies are large companies that have a lot of segments and operate in more than one industry, so they might not be comparable. So if you're dealing with a company such as General Electric that are in everything, 
or a 3M that's all over the place, you really need to be aware that this large um, conglomerate is really being com compared to another company of its kind. Does that make sense? But FASB, the Financial Accounting Standards Board, requires a diversified company to report profits or losses, certain revenues and expense items, and assets for each of its segments. So as you see here, this is Goodyear Tires. Goodyear shows sales broken down by different regions. It shows operating income by different regions and the assets by different regions. So if you look here at Goodyear, its primary focus are the, the large bulk of their sales comes from North America. Then the next is Europe, uh, the Middle East, and Africa. Then their small areas are the Latin American and the Asian areas. So it allows you to see really where they're drawing their revenues. It also allows you to see ultimately what kind of income is coming in. Look in 2009. They lost money in the North American segment, but the other ones carried them, even though their revenues were the most in North America. So my guess is that was when the auto industry was really hurting too. So they took a real hit in America during that period. Then you see here with their assets, how their assets relate to each segment. And ultimately, you can see here how their sales with their assets and their operating revenues all compare to each other. Um, for whatever reason, boy, in 2009, they really took a hit. But they've turned back around, haven't they? So out of their 17 million or billion in total assets, over 55% of them are through North America. So this just gives you some more insight as to how these large corporations are broken down on a smaller scale. Sources of information about these public companies that are traded on the stock exchanges come from reports the corporation publishes. These reports include what we call an annual report. They also have interim or quarterly financial statements. They have reports that are filed by the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission. Now these reports that the Securities and Exchange Commission requires have different names. The annual one's called a 10K, Quarterly is called a 10Q. Current reports are 8Ks, just so you know. Um, and then various uh, investment companies are going to provide information for users to help them understand how the different companies are doing. Wall Street, Moody's all have their own editorial about the companies. Okay, now we're going to look at various ratios we're going to, to understand to determine how liquid a company is and in various ratios to see what type of risk a company may be in. In Using these ratios, we can use these ratios to compare what we call horizontal analysis, trend, and vertical analysis. So let's take it and horizontal analysis. 
Horizontal analysis allows us to look at a company from one year to the next. So we get to see here changes from the previous year to the current year. When we do horizontal analysis, we can see the numbers, but sometimes what's even more a greater benefit is to look at it in terms of percentages because then you can see how these numbers fluctuated based on the whole. The percentage change is computed by 100 times the comparative year amount minus the base year amount divided it by the base. The base year is always going to be that first year in any data. So what we'll see here is Starbucks and we're going to see how their assets increased from one year to the next and we'll show you how this works. So if you see here, if you look at their total assets in 2010 they were six million or six probably billion three hundred and eighty five thousand. In 2011 they were seven billion three hundred and sixty thousand. Okay? So they went up from 2010 to 2011. They increased by 15.3%. Now this will show us how it changed from one year to the next. So if we look at uh, current assets, okay, so this one is looking at the change of current assets. If we look at the current assets here, the 3,794 in 2011, but in 2010 it was 2,756. Okay, so the difference here is one million and thirty-eight, one billion thirty-eight thousand five hundred. Okay, if we look, we take the current year, subtract it from what we call the base year, divide it by the base year. It allows you to see the percent increase. The base year in this scenario is going to be 2010. The base year will always be the oldest year. Okay? So as you see here, the 3794.9 minus the 2756.4 is 1,038.5. You take that 1,038.5, divide it by the 2,756,000, it's 37.7%. Okay, so their current assets went up significantly. Their total assets went up, but their current assets went up much more than their total assets percentage-wise. Look at their short-term investments really went up. And their inventories, for whatever reason, they really uh, loaded up on their inventories, which can be good or can be bad. Having that kind of increase in inventories isn't necessarily good. They might not be utilizing their money in the best way possible. Does that make sense? Now, if you look at their current liabilities and their total liabilities and shareholders' equity, when you look at the current liabilities, the current liabilities went up 16.7%. Their total liabilities went up 10%. So their current liabilities exceeded their total liabilities in this manner. But their current assets definitely exceeded their total assets too. So this allows you to see how we're using Starbucks and we're comparing from one year to the next. Does that make sense? Now, those were the, that was the balance sheet. Now here's the income statement. When we look at the income statement, we see 2010 
and 2011. Between 2010 and 2011, their gross margin increased 502 million, which is an 8% increase. Look at this. Their net income increased overall 31%. Now, it looks as though they had some restructuring that they had to do in 2010, which hurt their bottom line here. But even their um, operating expenses increased significantly, 37%. So this allows you to just gain an understanding of how their numbers changed from one year to the next. They must have sold interest income and other net. Look at this. This went up 130%. Their other, their interest income and other, that really increased significantly from one year to the next. So there was probably a significant event that we could go back and, and look at what happened in 2010 to understand what occurred here. Make sense? So Starbucks balance sheets for 2010 and 11 show assets increased by 15.3% and the shareholders' equity increased by 19.3%. Their income statement shows the net revenues increased by 9.3%. Their gross margin went up 8%. The total operating expenses increased uh, by 5%. Their operating income increased 21.8%. And overall, their net income went up 31%. So this allows us to look at a company and compare from one year to the next. So trend analysis then takes this horizontal analysis and from that we come up with calculations percentages from the base year and we can see trends of what's happening with the company. So instead of just using two years we're going to use more than two years. Now that index number is going to generally be that oldest year. The base year always gets set at 100%. Other years get measured in relation to that number. So if we look at a trend analysis of Starbucks over five years, then the net revenues in five years increased 24.3% over those five years. From the base year through the fifth year, their revenues went up 24%. Um, so if you see here, their net revenues here were at $9,411,000. Then in 2011, they're at $11 million. Okay? So, if this is the base, 2007, from the base year to 2011, they went up, whatever I told you, 31, 24.3%. So, you see here, oh, come on. It, you see here, we take 2007, and we make that 100%. Then we take the 2008 figure and we divide it by the base year. So if 94.11 is our 100%, 10,383 divided by 94.11, being that that's our 100%, shows this went up 10.3%. Then compared to this base year, this went up 3.9% to the base year. This is up 13% to the base year. Excuse me, I have to add them. 
10, 11, 3%, no, this is 3% increase to the base year. This one is 13% to the base year. And in 2011, their revenues went up 24% in relation to the base year of 2007. Okay, so everything's getting compared to that base year of 2007. So as you see here, if the 2007, the 945,000 is 100%, everything's going to be based on that. In 2008, the operating revenue should have gone down. Fifty-nine, one fifty, one eighty-two. That's almost double. Nine forty-five. Two thousand seven, two thousand eight. Oh, I see. It so basically in two thousand and seven, this is a hundred percent. In two thousand eight, the income went down almost half. So in relation to their income of 2007, they only made 41% of the income from 2007. In 2009, they made 59% of the income from 2007. Then in 2010, something changed. They increased the income from what they did in 2007 to 2010. It went up 50%. So their income in 2010 is 150% of what it was in 2010, excuse me, 2007. And then in 2011, compared to the base year, their income has almost doubled. Does that make sense? Their operating income. What we're going to do right now is we're going to do a problem. So let's do a problem similar to what we just reviewed. Let's look at SE3. Um, page 695. Where's my book? Here I am. Okay. Page six ninety five. SE three. Using two thousand twelve as the base year. Prepare a trend analysis for the data that follow and tell whether the results suggest a favorable or unfavorable trend. So we are going to take 2000 as the base year and compare. So what we'll do here is we're going to, whoops, excuse me, let me. 
we go. SC3. We're going to take 2012 to be 100%. Okay? So the 224,000 is our 100%. 272 divided by 224,000 means that our net sales went up 21.4% compared to 2012. So let me just show you how we're going to do this. Okay? Net sales. If our net sales this is two thousand fourteen, two thousand thirteen, and two thousand twelve. Three sixteen, two seventy two, two twenty four. So this is going to be our base year, okay? So the way we'll calculate this in terms of percent, this is 100%. So what we can do is this minus our base year divided by 100%. doing that right. It went up 48,000. But 48,000 divided by 224 ah, it doesn't like my formula. Okay, it went up 21.42%. What did we have over here? 21.4. So basically what we're doing here is if I take 224 as my base year and I take the difference of 272, subtract it from 224, I come up with the difference. I then divide that by 224,000. It's gone up 121.4%. Okay, compared to my base year. I can do the same here. If I take 316, subtract it from my base year, and then I divide it by D4. It's not doing what I want. 316 minus my 224 gives me 92,000. Whoops. 92,000 divided by divided by my 224 oh, is it's gone up 41%, so this would be an increase of 141.07, is that what the book says? 141.07 or 1%. Can you see how I'm doing that? Now I want you to try to do the accounts receivable. Always to the base always to the base because this trend is taking a series of years and comparing it to the base year okay when we're doing this so this is net sales now let's look at accounts receivable 
2014, it was 86. 2013, 64. 2012, 42. How does the counts receivable measure compared to 2012? So I'm going to give you a... So when we look at these figures here, and we see our net sales increased in 2013 21% compared to 2012. In 2014, they increased 41% to 2012. But look what happened with accounts receivable, guys. It increased 52% to 2012, and then in 2014, it increased 100 and almost 5% to 2012. Do you see how the sales increase less than the accounts receivable increased? Which means they're not getting their, say, their cash as soon. These res results show an unfavorable trend because the company's tying up increasing amounts of resources and accounts receivable without as high an increase in sales. Do you see that? So if these numbers went up the same, then it would be okay. But the sales went up 41%, but the accounts receivable went up 105%. They're not collecting their money as fast as they should. Okay? Let's look at SE5. SE5 shows Vision Inc.'s comparative balance sheets follow. We're going to prepare common size statements and comment on the changes from 2013 to 2014 by rounding to one decimal place. So what we're going to do here, whoops, ah, What we're doing, I, you know what, excuse me, I don't think we've gone through this yet where our total assets and our liabilities are at 100%. Never mind that yet. Let's look at SE4. SE4, I'm sorry about that, guys. SE4 tells us, Vision's comparative income statements follow. Compute the amount and percentage changes for the income statements and comment on the changes from 2013 to 2014. So as you see here, we've got our base is always going to be at 100% and that's what we're going to use to compare. So we're going to look at our 2013 and see the changes to 2014. So as you see here, what we're doing is we show, just like we um, saw in the PowerPoint, we show the 2014 line items. We show the 2013 line items. Then we show in here 
the increase or the decrease from 2014 minus 2013. And then this difference, this amount, we're going to divide that by our base year, 2013, to get an increase. So I'm going to give you a couple minutes to try to look at this. And as we look at this, remember, we're comparing one year to the next is all we're doing. This isn't a trend. We're just comparing. So we take the difference, 2013 being our base year, the increase. We take this 70,000 divided by 290. It increased 24.1%. Cost of goods sold. The difference between 2013 and 2014 is 48,000. 48,000 divided by 176 is a 27.3% increase. Then we do the same with gross margin. Same with our operating expenses, our operating income, interest. The income before income taxes has gone down. In 2013, it was 44,000. In 2014, it's 42,000. So it's decreased by 2,000. 2,000 divided by the 44,000, it's gone down 4.5%. The income tax expense has gone down 12.5%. So as you see here, the net income stayed the same. So there's no change there. The earnings per share stayed the same. There's no change there. Our gross, our net sales were increased by 24%. But look at this, our cost of goods sold went up more than what our gross sales went up. That's goofy. Which means to me that we're not getting the margin that we once received on our products we're selling. Our gross margin ultimately went up 19%. So what's happening there is our sales went up but our cost of goods sold was a little higher. So we still made m more money, but we're basically not selling the goods for the same markup or margin. Then we look at how our operating expenses went up 33%. So we basically... Um, even though our sales went up, our operating expenses went up greater, didn't they? You see that? Now, we always know when we're going to have more sales, we're probably going to have more costs to make those sales. But they went up greater than what we received in sales. So it tells us, look at this and tell, what's it look like here? So as you can see what I'm trying to do, I'm kind of talking through what I'm seeing. Yeah, it's good our net sales went up. But why were operating expenses so much greater than what our sales went up? Now, the good news is ultimately we ended up with the same net income just because what happened is our operating income did go up a little bit. Our interest expense went up a lot. But as a result, we didn't pay as many dollars in income taxes. So it leveled out for us the same. You see here, it, this is the analysis. The percentage increase in cost of goods sold was greater than the increase in net sales. As a result, the increase in gross margins limited to 19.3%. Also, although sales and gross margin have increased, Operating income is only up 3.7% because of the 33% increase in operating expenses. Income before income taxes has decreased as a result of the 40% increase in interest expense. That increase gets offset by a decrease in income taxes, so that net income is the same for both years. Overall, the trend is negative because net income 
did not increase despite the 24.1% increase in net sales. So this doesn't look good even though the net sales are up. The other items don't look as good. Cost of goods sold is up. That operating expenses are up. And bigger than that, that interest expense is really high. You see what I'm saying? So you normally expect if your sales go up, everything should follow suit. But that wasn't necessarily the case here. Do you see how we're taking this information and trying to draw some some uh, understanding. Okay. Um, let's go back to the PowerPoint now. This shows us something called trend analysis, a graph. This graph takes the base year, 2005, and from that, our base year is always going to be at 100%. Remember that? And then based from that initial year, we graph how the operating income um, measured, and we graph our net revenues. So as you see here, even though our net revenues ultimately increased, the operating income took a real dive. Okay? So our, our net revenues continued to climb higher than our base year. But our operating income did the opposite, which means there's a lot of expenses here. Okay? The graph helps you see it a little different, doesn't it? Doesn't it help you see, wow, on one hand, the net revenues look good, but when you compare that with what you expect the operating income should have done along with it, it didn't happen. Normally we expect that as revenues go up, our income should go up, but that's not the case here. So it's not necessarily favorable here because our expenses obviously increased significantly for our net income, our operating income to slide so low to our base year. Vertical analysis shows how the different components of a financial statement relate to a total figure in the statement. This is the next thing we're going to look at. The analyst sets the total figure at 100% and computes components based on that percent of the total. The resulting financial statement is expressed in the term called a common size statement. Vertical analysis and these common size statements help compare the importance of specific components of a business and identify changes from one year to the next. Sometimes we use these for companies too to see how companies fared between the two companies. So we're going to look at Starbucks again. Here we're looking at the balance sheets 2011, we're showing assets at 100%. 2010, we're showing liabilities and equity. At 100%. I'm a little confused. Rounding some did. Assets, liability. So if we're showing in 2010, our assets are 100% of the whole. 
Then based on that, we show how those assets are broken down. We see current assets are 51.6% of all the assets. We show property, plant, and equipment are 32% of our total assets. We see goodwill at 4.4, long-term investments at 6.6. .6. Then we know our liabilities and stockholders' equity combined have to be 100%, you know, because assets equal liabilities plus owners' equity. And we see the breakdown of our liabilities and stockholders' equity. We've got almost 60% of stockholders' equity compared to 28.2% of our liabi current liabilities and 12.2% of our long-term liabilities. Then, when we look at 2010, we're looking at the same thing here. So you can see when we're looking at Starbucks and we're looking at 2010 compared to 2011, really the liabilities and stockholders' equity hasn't changed a lot. It's increased, our stockholders' equity section has increased 2%, but for the most part, things have stayed pretty stable. When you look at the assets, our, in 2010, our property, plant, and equipment was about almost 6% higher in 2010 than it is in 2011. And our current assets in 2010 to 2011 have gone up about 9%. Everything else is fairly stable. Our long-term investments increase. So what that probably tells me is in 2010, we had some long-term investments. And by 2011, we had converted those into current assets. You see that? So the graph really helps give you a picture of where the changes took place between one year and the next. So this is the common size balance sheet. Do you see how our total assets are at 100%? And also our total liabilities and shareholders' equity will also be at 100%. And then what we do is we take our current assets, that figure, divide it by our total assets to come up with what percent are our current assets to our total assets. We do the same with long-term investments, property, plant, and equipment, and that's how we graph those previous, that previous slide. The income statement, we're going to do the same way. Our net revenues are going to be at 100%. And after our, if our net revenues are at 100%, we're going to take all the other figures on the income statement and compare them in relation to our net revenues. So as you can see here, in between 2010 and 2011, our cost of sales went up just slightly. Our operating expenses went down a little. And our net income overall has increased almost 3% from one year to the next. That's pretty good. So it makes sense that our income taxes will also increase if our net income increases too. This is a, a favorable comparison. Again, you see our net revenues are at 100%, and then we compare everything to our net revenues. So our cost of sales, we'll take that figure, divide it by what our net revenues are to come out with the percent. You see the net income was at 8.9%, and in 2011, it was at 10.7%. Let's take a moment now and go to our book 
and do SE5. So we are going to do the same thing we just saw. We are going to look at these balance sheets and our total assets in both years are going to be at 100%. And our total liabilities and stockholders' equity will be at 100%. And then we'll take our current assets, the 48,000 divided by 308,000, will give us the percent of current assets to total assets. And we'll do the same with property, plant, and equipment. So I'm going to put up for you You see how total assets are at 100% there? Same with stockholders' equity. And we compute our numbers in the term of a percent based on our total assets. So take a minute to do this.